Dave, I've got a question for you. When I say the words portable, powerful, and professional, what does it make you think of? It makes me think of Brad Geiger in a suit, but it also makes me think of <laughs> the Wacom One from the good folks at WACOM.com, Wacom, uh, which we use in our studios. Am I right, friend? Did I guess right? Absolutely. You guessed exactly right. Our sponsors for Comic Lab, once again, Wacom. And uh, we're thrilled to uh, welcome them back as a sponsor because, as you've pointed out, we both use those in our studios day in and day out. And they are indeed powerful, portable, and most of all, professional tablets that we can count on. It is a match made in heaven to have them as sponsors of the show because this is a product uh, without ever having met the folks uh, from Wacom before that yeah. we have used for the better part of 10, 15 years in our own studios. So it, yeah. it is it is like uh, asking a duck if they would recommend water. We love Wacom. <laughs> we use them on a daily basis in our own studios. Uh, and so having them as sponsors is a perfect match, and we are so happy to welcome them aboard. So do go check them out over at WACOM.com and check out that Wacom One while you're there because it is a fantastically powerful, portable, perfect device for your on-the-go cartooning. Precisely. So, Brad, the other night, uh, the family is doing the dishes, and I have Spotify on in the background on one of my playlists. God knows which one. And uh, the gambler comes on from Kenny Rogers. Oh, I know like, why it went on to Ken. I was listening to Dolly Parton, and Dolly Parton, for whatever reason, transitions into Kenny Rogers, probably because, because they did that. Because, of course, it does. does. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the song they did together? They did, like, three that were really good. But. It was the best one was Islands in the Stream. Islands in the Stream. That uh, Islands in the Stream. Anyway, so... Uh, Kenny Rogers comes on The Gambler, and my kids, who for no good reason would know 70s music, start singing along to The Gambler. You got to know when to hold them. When to hold them. <laughs> know <laughs> when to fold And I'm like, how do you when guys know this song about poker? And they both said, Brad Geiger taught us this song when he taught us Texas Hold'em. And I go, what's happening? <laughs> What's happening? So apparently when you were teaching how to play Texas Hold'em, which I remember, do you remember that summer vacation where you got oh, here? We and had so much fun. We yeah, your daughter was really turning into a poker fanatic. Yeah, and uh, got pretty good. But apparently she when, was very when, good. when we were playing uh, Texas Hold'em, you were in the back going, you got to know when to hold them, when to hold them. And I was like, that's amazing. So not only is Brad corrupting my, my offspring by teaching poker, he's also teaching them songs about about poker <laughs> regale them with regale them with corruption oh my god that makes me so proud to hear <laughs> that was fun though playing playing uh, poker with brad geiger is amazing because oh. uh there is i can only say a cornucopia of tells on brad's face when he's playing <laughs> poker <laughs> oh i'm the worst poker player everything happens right up here on my face i i have never seen a goatee twitch but Brad has a goatee that can twitch. So if he's if he's if he's got a royal straight, that goatee is twitching like mad on his chin. I don't know how a muscle on a chin even knows how to twitch like that, but it's the first time you've ever seen somebody with a bow tie actually spin like in the Three Stooges. <laughs> Brad put, uh, I don't know why, mid-game, Brad put a giant flower on his lapel, and all of a sudden it would start squirting water at key moments during the game. And I was like, that's got to be a tell. But you had, your eyebrows were doing the most incredible Vincent Price impersonation during the game. You're like, no, no, uh, I'll hold. Right eyebrow literally goes up six inches on your face <laughs> oh, oh yes we had a lot of fun doing that, that that was a lot of fun and on that note i'm gonna oh. say hello everybody and welcome to comic lab the show about brad geiger's poker tells and making comics <laughs> and i'll see you in raise you 10 making a living from comics i'm brad geiger the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of evil inc and i'm his pal dave kelly cartoonist of drive and sheldon and co-director of the comics documentary stripped and this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So, Dave, Dave, 
Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. We have an incredibly good show for everybody today. As we are recording this, it is the uh, first week of June. And I got to tell you, I know the pandemic, Brad, is going a little long in the sense that we all have to be uh, forgiving of how things are going. But we yes. have yet to hear the Eisner Awards for this year. And I find that <sighs> sort of intriguing. We're like three weeks out from where Comic-Con, four weeks out from where Comic-Con would be. And we still haven't heard about yeah. uh, uh, the Eisner Awards. Yeah, I usually have this kind of planned out. It's usually like late April, early May that they make the announcement. Usually, this is June 8th. By today, usually I'm just pulling off of my Eisner depression. (laughs) So so this is this is throwing my (laughs) this is throwing my whole schedule off. I'm pulling back into self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. Usually by now I've called you and and badmouthed all the people that got nominated. As you patiently, as you patiently say, yes, I know. Yes, I know. And, and, but, and, and by now I'm just, I'm, I'm just starting to crawl out of it. This is going to mean I'm going to, it won't be until July at best that I start to crawl out of my post Eisner funk. My favorite is the Eisner award nominees come out about 20 minutes goes by. Then you get the phone call from Brad Geiger, and without even saying hello, the first thing he says is, this son of a bitch! That's that's the first thing he says when he sees the nominees. This son of a bitch! This joker! It's just a half an hour of that on the phone. What? Yeah. Who, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> so you should have seen when he got to my name last year. Boy, that was a bit hurtful. Oh, that's uh, Yeah. Who's, yeah, who's that, this well, joker? I- <laughs> Yeah, I just I just read his name and just paused. <laughs> and then went on to the next just, one. <laughs> just just let it fester and then went on to the next one, yeah. Do you remember in George Orwell they had the uh, five minutes hate? Uh, that is sort of the, the thing that I think uh, every cartoonist, if they're being honest with themselves, does with every award nominee list is you kind of do the yes. five minutes hate of, what, this person, that person, no, <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you just you just go through and oh the son of a bit. This <laughs> this person again, this person again, honest to God. And then you just yeah, it just it's just it's a good way to eat up a, a Saturday night. Oh, absolutely. So I'm looking forward to my five minutes hate with my friend Brad Geiger when those Eisners come yeah. out. So uh look for that. <laughs> Unless of course one of us gets nominated, in which case the sunshine and roses for that oh, whole process yeah, will come. Yeah. Like, no, no, this year is better than previous years. This year is <laughs> you, finally yeah. they've got it right. <laughs> then it's a much different conversation. It's like, well, they got some good judges this year. Uh, that's that's yeah, good that's, to see. I, they, you know what? They landed a, they stuck the landing on a few of these, a few key yeah. ones. They really, they really did a great job. <laughs> you know. You know, Dave, you know how I was telling you uh, about how these wor- awards don't mean a freaking thing? Uh, this year, this year, I think they might mean something. <laughs> I really do. I think people are going to remember this year is the year the Eisners meant something. As Brad pads around the house with a solid gold crown on it that just says special. <laughs> <laughs> Doing my kingly walk. Yeah, exactly. Pardon me, Eisner nominee coming through. Well, Brad, all right, we got, let's jump into our first Comic Lab question for this week over at patreon.com slash Comic Lab. This comes in from Jay Lark, and Jay Lark writes, Hey, Brad and Dave, what is your elevator pitch? What do you oh. tell someone if you only have 10 seconds to convince them to check out Drive, Evil Inc., et cetera? What makes a good elevator pitch and how would you recommend someone go about creating or refining their own? Loving the show. It's always entertaining and inspiring. Jay Lark. Jay, thank you so much for that. And I got to say, this is one of the hardest things that I do to the point, Brad, where I would even go so far as to say I am actively not good at this. And we can talk about that. But first, let me let me throw the question at you. How do you do an elevator elevator pitch, Brad Geiger? There's only one way to do it. Uh, it, it, that I've found, and that is, this is, and, and, and this is where the one time I'll tell you that a comic convention is good, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that is to perfect an elevator pitch, because it's the true. only way I found to do it is to pitch it over and over and over and watch the response you get yeah. from strangers and then change it a little bit, uh, you know, keep what works, lose what doesn't, uh, that, and, 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 uh, that's the only way I know how to, how to actively do it. 
the objective of an elevator pitch is to give your reader or, or your prospective reader something that they can uh, hold on to that gives them a reason to try the comic. Right. And that's that's essential. You're not trying to tell them everything that the comic is about, uh, although there's a there's a pinch of that. Uh, but what you're trying to do is tell them the essential portion of this comic that's going to entice them to read more and learn more about the comic. And it's it's very uh, similar if you read uh, books like Save the Cat, which is a book on on screenwriting. Uh, uh, Blake, uh, uh, I forget what his last name is. Blake something. Blake Shelton, I want to say. Anyway, well, <laughs> the author of that <laughs> book. That the, isn't that the singer, Blake Shelton? I don't remember. Uh, oh, that anyway. might be a singer. Yeah. Well, anyway. In Two Save old the men Cat. discuss the world. This is what the show has become. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about a log line. And, and that's a, 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 it's, it's basically the elevator pitch for a screenplay. Mm. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's in, intensely important to do. Uh, so we're going to talk about it a little bit more today uh, and, and what you should be looking at it. But uh, the only way I was able to develop w the closest to an elevator pitch that I ever got, which was Evil Inc. as a corporation for supervillains, uh, because it's easier to do evil if you do it legal, right? right. Uh, which, by the way, isn't even a good elevator pitch. Uh, and and I, well, I, Because there's there's nothing about legality that comes into evil. Like I just used it because it rhymed. It right. was good wordplay. It, it had a little yeah, interior smile. rhyme thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't even, if somebody was pitching that to me, I wouldn't even, I'm not sure I would tell them it's a great elevator pitch. Uh, but, but if you want to talk about how to do it, that's the one time I would go to a, uh, to a convention and just stand on my hind legs the entire time, refining my elevator pitch. Uh, so my question to you, Dave, is what's the elevator pitch for Drive? Well, OK, uh, as it as self admittedly right from the top, I said I am bad at this. This is not something that I am good at. I, yeah. I actively uh, hate doing it. I know that I'm bad at it, but I know it's important. I've done Comic Cons now for 20, 21 years. And so literally for five days at San Diego Comic Con, you're trying to to refine this quick, like five to 20 word pitch on what it could be yeah. right and here is the fundamental crux of the problem for me for brad for you for everyone listening is that you as a creator see everything that the comic is and could be and will eventually yeah. blossom into right uh and so it's so hard for you to reduce something that for you has miles of meaning miles of possibility into one little reductive sentence and so you're trying to say, look how high my ladder goes. Look at all the rungs on the ladder. Whereas the yes. person at the Comic-Con is saying, I just want the first step. Just get yeah. me on the ladder. That's all I want. And you're like, and you're trying to think of like, yes, but the ladder goes, oh, it goes so high. There's so many steps, so many wrinkles to this ladder. And you're like, I don't care. I just want, just get me on the step. Just get me on the step. And you're like, oh, okay. What's, uh. It's the difference between if you were a florist and you were trying to sell roses, okay? You'd have two people trying to sell roses. One of them says, take a look at this flower. It's got 463 petals. It's got thorns on it. It's got red coloring. Uh, the, the leaves are a little bit jagged around the edges. It's got a yeah. long uh, stem. And the second, and, and by the way, this person is never making the sale. The second person says, hey, you, come here, smell this. That person's going to sell roses because it's all about the smell, right? right it, that's right, the first right. thing that's going to get the beauty is next. The uh, all of the, the the symbolism. But if you want to get somebody to sell to, to to buy roses, you go, hey, you smell this. It smells great. That's how you get people to sell roses. You know what's the perfect example of that log line, Brad? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. <laughs> Yes, you did. Bingo. Done it. That's the You've that's the it. justification for that log line. Anyway, so uh yeah, here's the thing is that uh, it's a little bit like dating in that yeah. the first date is the polite lie that gets someone <laughs> interested, right? Yeah. It's the perfect version of you that doesn't have any weird idiosyncrasies that didn't, you know, that doesn't uh I don't know, enjoy model making of of uh, the Enterprise C at night at 3 a.m. I don't know what what version yeah. of you 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 might not want to reveal on a date. Um 
But uh, all that first date is the polite lie that makes someone intrigued that goes, oh, OK. Yeah. And in a way, that sort of elevator pitch of, OK, the story is Iron Man meets the Muppets. That's a polite yeah. lie. It is neither Iron Man, nor is it the Muppets, nor is it Iron Man meets the Muppets. But it's that's the polite lie that gets you in. Right. Yeah. Um, however, I I'm not I'm p- totally fine with the polite lie. Because all they're asking for is sell me on this, like make me intrigued, right? And Give a lot me a of people reason. at Comic Con want to be intrigued. They're actively looking for yes. new things to read. So I get that, and I'm okay with the the polite lie aspect of it. For me, the harder part is that first thing that we mentioned, which is it's so hard to be reductive as a creator yeah. of the thing that you see so much potential for into a single line. It's like, in, in a way, it is like dating of like, here is all the idiosyncrasies and interesting bits of Brad Geiger reduced to, hello, I'm Brad Geiger. It's really hard to make that first impression thing, uh, both for dating and yeah. for log lines. I mean, and I'm being serious about that, you know? Yeah. So, Dave, what do you think about the uh, this is a standard practice. I don't know whether it's standard, but you hear this an awful lot in elevator pitches where somebody says it is kind of like and then they'll say an established property meets and another established property. Right. Right. So it's like, oh, it's like the Adams family meets Gilligan's Island. Uh, And I used to do that with Greystone Inn because it was such a hat on a hat on a hat concept. It's a comic strip about a comic strip starring a gargoyle. It's kind of like Bloom County meets the Larry Sanders show. Right. Because I was trying to talk about the whole idea that it was backstage and kind of breaking a fourth wall type of deal. Uh, What do you think about those kind of elevator pitches that use the that kind of template uh i when i was younger i thought it was a cheat the older i get the more i'm like it's perfectly acceptable i really do i think i think it's like we're all pressed for time it's basically saying hey do you like this type of humor do you like this type of storytelling well then you may like something that approximates both and that was my quick in and out way of getting you uh the 10 cent version of what this is so uh, for example, uh, Dylan McConus, our friend, uh, uh, um, came up with an excellent log line for Drive, which was Dune meets the Muppets. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I would not have, like the scope and the seriousness that is Dune, this h- hardcore science fiction meets the mm-hmm. goofy, delightful characters, which is also the case with Drive. That there's, And I was yeah. like, oh, that's a good one. I First of all, I never would have uh, compared my own stuff to the Muppets, I and but it works. It gets the idea across, you know. Yeah. And um, the the one of the best log lines for Drive, and it's not a log line because it, it only gives you the emotion. It doesn't tell you the story. Is a journalist was doing a write up on Drive, and they said the story is serious, the characters are hilarious, and I was like, oh, that's great. So I have thrown yeah. that on every book as as a quote from that journalist because it's like it really sells it. The story's serious, the characters are hilarious, and right. um, but as far as a log line for Drive. I have 19 different versions, Brad, all of which yeah. are bad. And they're <laughs> they're So the the best one that I can come up with that I use a lot at Comic-Cons is I often do say it's Hitchhiker's Guide meets Dune. And most yeah. people if they're into sci-fi, they're like, "Okay, I'm vaguely intrigued by that. What is what is Hitchhiker's Guide meets Dune like? I don't know what that's like." So, and yeah. then I give her the longer pitch of like, okay, look, there is a second human Spanish empire that's conquered the earth and it's conquered a good chunk of the galaxy. There's aliens that want their technology back. They're coming at war. They're going to win. Humanity has to do ba ba da ba ba da ba. And then it becomes a paragraph, which is not a log line. It's, a, it's like a synopsis. It's a summary. Uh, that's yeah. what I do. Um, I stood next to you with, at Comic-Cons for, for years, and you very successfully did You Can Do More Evil If You Do It Legal. And I have yeah. to say there was a hit risk, hit miss ratio that yeah. was higher hit than it was miss but it was interesting how some people that log line just wouldn't work on they would, they would just be like I, I i either don't get it or i don't care you know and and not only that but they would take it uh, the reason i i throttled back on using it because uh, very often people would end up thinking that it was a political kind of comic Right. And in other words, I'd say, well, you can do more evil if you do it legal. And then they'd make a political comment either from the left or the right. I would get them both equally. Right. And it'd be like, yeah, yeah, see that that's not what this is. Yeah. <laughs> There's, yeah. There is a precious little politics uh, involved in this precious little social commentary, even in Evil Inc. It really is about uh, more 
having fun with superhero tropes and, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I, I've already uh, name dropped Save the Cat once, so I'm going to do it again. I, I started adding that to my storytelling class uh, this semester. And uh, when Blake Snyder, thank you, helpfully pointed out uh, <laughs> to me, uh, Blake Snyder, the author of that, uh, talked about log lines. Uh, uh, Blake talks about three recipes for a log or three ingredients for a log line. The okay. hero, the goal, and the problem. And if your log line incorporates those three things, hero, goal, and problem, then you've got a good log line. Uh, and, and, uh, I, I, having said that, I still don't know how I would incorporate that into evil ink. And to be fair, since I haven't done comic, uh, conventions in well over five or six years, it's, it's a low priority item for me. Uh, but I, but I do like that idea of a, a good elevator pitch. Uh, one of the ways that you could build that would be to think about a sentence that talks about your hero their goal and the uh, problem. What's interesting about that as a log line construction is that's also, if you think about it, the most reductive way to, to, to describe story structure hero yes. meets problem. And on the other side of problem is goal. And that's, that's the, the most basic way to describe, describe a story. And, and that's so, what I would say week in and week out to my students. I'm like, listen, if you don't, don't make storytelling harder than it is, you've got a hero. They want something. There's something in the way. Now you got a story. <laughs> so, well, so let's <laughs> really try to what construct, it comes down to. Let's try to construct this. In both Brad and my case with Evil Inc. and Drive, it is not hero driven, it's cast driven. So you would yeah. have to come up with some sort of descriptor, either super villains, superheroes, or super powered people, something like mm -hmm. that. What would be the problem? Face real life and then power their way through it? Or how, uh, what would be the goal, you know? Evil Inc. started very different when I started really focusing on my writing and really trying to apply uh, some some uh, archetypes and so, and some structure to my writing. Uh, very quickly, it became uh, a, a, a Captain Heroic has met the woman of his dreams and wants to marry her, uh, you know, live out the rest of his days with her. There's only one problem. You know, her job is to kill him. Or, you right. know, although that's not quite right, but, you know, but she's a super villain. That's really what, what evil link right now in the last three years, since I really started focusing on uh, structure, that's really what evil link has become. It's become what happens when heroes fall in love with villains. That's, oh, that's there's really your log line. Every, he, here's yeah. what happens when heroes fall in love with super villains. That's great. That's your log line. That's yeah. great. And there's got to be a more creative way to put it, but that's really, even with secondary characters, there's all of these people falling in love with people they shouldn't fall in love with <laughs> and, and having way too much fun with them, uh, even though on the surface, you know, they're, they're playing for different sides, uh, it, it, but it, that doesn't matter. They, they still end up uh, uh, forming relationships. So there's, there's something in that, even even after Captain Heroic and and Mismatch, if they ever do build a relationship together, uh, there's all kinds of other uh, stories that follow that same kind of uh, uh, pattern that uh, will keep the story moving forward. It it no longer really has become about a corporation uh, uh, for super villains. No. That and frankly, really I think well. you found you found a more effective reduction. Frankly, I think as a friend, yeah. I, I'm telling you that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. listen, if I were to use that Blake Snyder technique, I would say something like the technology that humanity used to build its galactic empire was stolen from aliens who want it back with an almost religious fervor. But that's not very compelling, you know? Yeah. It's too it's too chewy for one. But yeah. that's what you need to do is that you need to describe there's a human empire. They built their galactic empire with technology stolen from aliens. The aliens want it back with an almost religious fervor. Uh, and so those are the three elements of, of problem, uh, hero. The hero in this case is technically the human empire or yeah. humanity, broadly speaking. Uh, and then the problem is they're about to go to war that they're going to lose. And the goal yeah. is survival for lack of, and, and, and uh, stasis, frankly, is the goal here, you know, to return back mm -hmm. to normalcy. 
So, uh, it, but it doesn't make for a very sexy log line, right? It's, it's once I heard you say that, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. Yeah. And now the gods want fire back. Oh, oh, see, and this is why it's often easier to have an outsider help you construct it because you see all the wrinkles and the permutations and Brad goes, bada bing, bada boom. It's Prometheus. <laughs> he stole the fire. The gods want it back. That's your log line. Yeah, it, it, but you're uh, right. I mean, uh, you got to thread the needle there, but uh, but the beginning sentence in one version of that elevator pitch is the gods want the fight. The gods want fire back from Prometheus, but the year is you know twenty. Uh, the year is you know star date thirty forty five, and they're driving starships now. You know, right. it, I know what the first part is. The second part just has to say, but it's sci fi. But it's sci fi. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the the downside to that, I like that a lot. The downside is there's a significant portion of the population that doesn't know who Prometheus is. You yeah. know what I mean? It, 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 it is kind of a heady kind of elevator They never pitch. got a classics it's, it's, education of like, this is Greek yeah. or Roman mythology. Um, right. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, all this to say, J-Lark, is that it is uh, for both Brad and I, and I think, frankly, for any uh, artist that's honest about it, it's really hard to mm -hmm. do. I would invite you to in involve people who love you in your life or love your work. I remember one time, Brad, I had my readers a little contest for a sketch giveaway, like, hey, help yeah. me create a log line. And they, uh, unfortunately, this was one of the this was one of the problems we've come into in the past. If people were good writers, they would be writing their own comic. Yeah, they, with all the best intentions and with all the love, these were terrible log lines, you know. Yeah. So it's not like yeah. it's not like they didn't have good intentions. It's not like they didn't understand what the story at the crux was about. They were just bad writers. So yeah, find yourself a, a friend who loves you, who's good at writing, like Brad Geiger, and who can say it's Prometheus, dummy, it's Prometheus stealing the fire, <laughs> and then find a way to God's work that into the, the fire back. Find a way to work that in. But also, mashups are good. Uh, take a look at how Blake Snyder constructs it. I think that's also a great a great way to do it. Um, and good luck with it, because it honestly is one of the hardest things to do as a writer is reduce who you are into 10 words, is basically what a yeah. logline is asking you to do, you know? Yeah, it's very difficult. Well, listen, Dave, I've got one. Uh, this comes in from Jack Reichel, and it's 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 uh, a kind of a, something that just happened recently. So I wanted to make sure we got it on the show uh, real quick here. And that okay. is this. Did you see that Kickstarter partnered with Bookshop.org? How is or might this affect your post Kickstarter sales strategy for your books, whether through Backerkit, your own site, Amazon or anywhere else? So huh. I went and I took a look, uh, and here's the uh, the announcement, okay? It's just in case you're not familiar with this. Uh, Kickstarter partners with Bookshop.org in a new deal, which could stoke comic sales, Dave. Comic okay. sales could be stoked. The crowdfunding platform Kickstarter partnered with the online bookstore Bookshop.org for it to be a marketplace for successfully crowdfunded book projects, especially comics and graphic novels. With the partnership, Bookshop.org will market and sell these Kickstarter-funded books from various publishers directly to its online customers and sell them on behalf of independent bookstores. Quote, with this partnership, we want to celebrate the long literary lives books can live, blah, 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 blah. Uh, launching today, this partnership will begin with curated lists on bookshop.org of available books from Kickstarter funded projects. And then they've got a link where you can submit yours too. Uh, so the question is, uh, how is this going to change how we market our books? Okay, so this is a fun game for everyone to play along with at home because Brad, uh, we kind of semi-intentionally talked about this. Brad has done the research on this. I have yeah. intentionally not. And I'm going to guess as someone who has worked online for 20 years, uh, what this business model is and how uh, or if it can benefit us at all. And then Brad yeah. is going to reveal how the actual business model works. And we're going to see if I'm right about this. Okay, so 
Brad and I always say on the show, take out the middleman, right? Reduce <sighs> as many middlemen to the process as you can, which is why it was always the case that we were never a fan of Diamond Comics because we would send no. a Diamond. Diamond would take a big slice. They'd send to a comic book shop. A comic book shop would take a big slice. Uh, there would be loss and damage along the way for a percentage of the books that you sent. That would take a slice out of your profits. And then you'd get a check six months later for a dollar for the 14 books that you sold through comic book shops, right? It was yeah. always like, oh, every middleman got their cut before you, before you got uh, anything, and it was always terrible. Anyway, so here is my spidey sense of what I'm hearing, mm -hmm. Brad, in this deal, and you can tell me if you're right. Kickstarter uh, somehow is going to get a tiny little percentage. I don't think Kickstarter, they're, but they're going to get some kind of rem remuneration for this because they wouldn't lend their name to it unless they got a t they got their beak wet a little bit, right? So I'm guessing uh, less than one to one percent of the sale will go to Kickstarter. Bookshop.org, I think the name was. Is that what it is? Bookshop.org. I feel mm -hmm. like they are going to take the master chunk of the slice. I feel like what this is, is this is some VC backed uh, 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 company that, that some tech bros put in 20, 30 million dollars. They got this bookshop.org. And then here's the problem. Mrs. Pilkington, how, who for 35 years has run the Blue Sky Bookshop in Fort Collins, Colorado, yeah. but she has no technical wherewithal. But she understands from the kids that these online sales are important for saving an independent bookshop. So somewhere at the last uh, American Library Association meeting, she got a flyer for bookshop.org. And so now she's letting them sell her books for her online. They're going to take... 40% of the cut and Blue Sky Books in Fort Collins, Colorado is going to get 2% of that sale. And then Brad Geiger is going to end up with 20 to 55% to, to of the sale uh, as his profit. And do I, am I guessing right, Brad, as to what this is? Uh, well, uh, so uh, in general, I agree with your guess. Uh, and, 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 uh, I, I don't know the answer to some of those questions, like how much uh, anybody how gets. How much is Mrs. Pilkington going to get? We need yeah, to know yeah. if Mrs. P Mrs. Pilkington's getting screwed on this. Listen, Mrs. Pilkington is asking herself the same question. I guarantee you that. <laughs> but uh, so, but there's so many things to unpack here. Uh, so I, I, first, I'm going to answer Jack's question, and that is, how is this going to change how I market my books? The right. answer to that is, if there's a number less than zero, it's going to be found somewhere in there. That's the amount that my, uh, that's the amount I'm going to change how I'm doing based on this announcement. In other words, it's not going to affect anything. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so you're saying you're, you're from the outset, you can, your spidey senses are already telling you this is not a Brad Geiger focused deal. No. Like you're not interested in this. No, okay. no, no. And, and the more I looked into it, I did all of like, when I, when you say research, I, I looked at it for like five minutes and I'm like, okay, I can see where this is. Going. And that's something I want to talk about too, uh, to our listeners. Uh, a while ago, I, I, you remember on the show, I said, one of the things I want this show to do is to remove the stigma of a day job because so many of us, we want to be full-time cartoonists. We want to lose that day job and we make bad decisions based on that. And mm -hmm. I said, I want to remove that stigma. You're still a professional cartoonist if you've got a day job. Uh, here's another one I want our listeners to really take to heart. Stop getting excited about press releases. <laughs> <laughs> Stop reading these press releases. Listen, a good press release, it's just like when people read that press release about the far side coming back, right? And and right. we we sat there and did a show saying, guys, the far side's not coming back. <laughs> that was a well-written press release. You got to stop falling for it. Uh, stop getting excited about press releases. Uh, and and I all I did was like, Five, five minutes of research on this. And by research, I mean, I just clicked a couple links and said, oh yeah, look at that. So here's, here's the, oh yeah, look at that uh, moment. First of all, uh, if, it, 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 and this was in the press release, curated list. In other words, they choose who's going to be on this list of books that they're going to put out uh, through this partnership. Well, okay. I don't know about you, Dave, but I've never been part of, in 20 years, I've never <laughs> been part of any curated list. Anytime there's a curated list, I'm off that list. <laughs> I, I, as a cartoonist, 
as a publisher, as a podcaster, anytime there's curating to be done, I'm off the list. So as soon as I see curated lists, and I'm and I'm not being sarcastic about that, I know I'm out. And not just the not safe for work stuff, I'm out, period, of any curated list. I'll be honest, for the most part, a lot of humor gets called out of those curated lists because yep. it always tends to end up being the book that has meaning. The book that oh. and listen, there's no there's no shot against that necessarily. I'm just saying anytime an editor wants to change the world, I'm curating a list. It's a list of, of what I like to describe as broccoli movies. It's all the movies that are <laughs> that are good for you that you know you should eat, but you're not actively choosing because it tastes like broccoli. So it's a broccoli movie. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so there, there's a lot of broccoli comics, too. Where it's like no one's actively choosing this, but an editor will choose it to curate because yep. that's a book that's changing the world. That kind of thing. So speak. Speaking of the Eisners, these are the books that are nominated for Eisners, right? They're those gravitas comics that you, the gravitas, gravitas comics. That's the, that, that's the word. Yeah, they're they're like, oh, yeah. this is this is full of gravitas, and it's like, yeah, I'm sure it is, but I'd like to read something that makes me happy. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to, fee- I'd like to not get to the end of the book and then and, and, and immediately want to just you know lay down in a in, in a in a fetal position and cry. Uh, so. Uh, so curated list leaves me out. Here's the next one. And this, this is all I did was click on the, the, the link that said, you know, would you like to be considered? Here's the text from the sign up. Thank you for submitting your book for inclusion in the Kickstarter bookshop Starfront. We're happy to consider any book that was originally funded on Kickstarter and is now available for distribution through Ingram, which powers oh. bookshop's inventory. <laughs> No, David. Okay, hold on. So my idea that bookshop.org was a $30 million uh, VC-funded uh, startup, it's Ingram is the startup that put that. It's a front-facing for Ingram. That's what it is, isn't it? Can I ask you a question, Dave? Yeah. Here's here's my question for you, and, and tell me if I'm going too fast here. What does Ingram do if you if you if, if you boiled it down to their own elevator pitch? What does Ingram do? I think Ingram would self-describe themselves as they are the connective tissue between publishers and booksellers, right? And th- I think that's what they would describe themselves as. Uh, yeah, yeah. For me, I, I would describe right. Ingram. Uh, okay, what would you what would you say? No, I think you're right. What Ingram does is it puts your books in bookstores, right? Right. Ingram is a distributor. They put your books in bookstores, or if somebody right. wants to order it, they can get it. If I've got Ingram already, stop me if I'm going too fast. What do I need this deal for? Right. Well, here's the thing. This is structured. Now that I know that Ingram is behind this, this is Ingram's way of saying there's an entire percentage of the market books that have succeeded very well. Let's let's say uh, there's a there's a comic book that got two hundred thousand on on Kickstarter, but they don't have an agent. They're self distributed. They're self published. But Ingram wants that tiny little slice of that market because they're not currently going to Ingram. They didn't even know that Ingram existed. They had never previously heard the word Ingram. You know what I mean? As a cartoonist, so Ingram's like, how do we get them? We hook them with this thing called Bookshop dot org. By the way, I see what you're doing with the dot org, Ingram. You can't fool me. But anyway, keep going. Uh, so yeah. Ingram Ingram basically is trying to, to hone in on a slice of the market that they currently don't distribute, which is independently oh. produced comic books and graphic novels, I think. And by the way, we don't know if this is actually the, the case. We're both surmising. But if I'm understanding you right, what you're saying is it might be the case that uh, this is the way that Ingram gets new people to sign up for their service yes. because they see this and they say, oh, I've got to be through Ingram. Then I'll sign up for Ingram. They're not trying to get the Brad Geigers who have been around for 20 years. They're trying to get, um, I don't know, someone who's 25 who had a big hit on Kickstarter and their book did two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars on on you know even one hundred thousand dollars on on Kickstarter. Ingram wants yeah. to hook that person into the an already existing ecosphere of which that cartoonist was not aware even existed, right? So, all right. So I was I was off on my guess, but my spidey senses were still right in the sense that Ingram going to take a slice, the bookstore yeah. going to take a slice, and yeah. probably Kickstarter going to take a little slice. Yeah, and 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 I don't know I, I don't know how all of that works out, but I would assume that that would probably be the case too. Uh, but yeah, my I, as soon as I saw Ingram, my thought was if I've got if I'm distributing my books through Ingram, 
What do I need this whole thing? That's what Ingram does is they're their distributor. Other than maybe they're not distributing to independent bookstores and this is an outreach, which is fine. But I, as soon as I saw that, uh, it was like, wait a minute. If this whole thing is about distribution, if I already have a distributor, I don't need this. And, and maybe this is a way for them to, to get yeah. more people to sign up through Ingram. I don't know. But, but here's I the thing. Did, oh, I, I want to stop for one second because uh, this yeah. this now that my hackles are raised using bookshop.org as the nomenclature, right? Specifically the dot org, but also the word bookshop and then mm-hmm. highlighting in the press release that it'll be sold through independent mom and pop bookstores. They might as well have used the words latte and kale in there and well in terms of, <laughs> hey, independent artists, we're all just small time uh, artists trying to make the world better, aren't we? When in fact, Ingram is a global corporation with massive audiences in, in big cities all around the world. They could give two shits about independent bookshops. They're you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they're selling this as like, hey, artist with your latte in your hand, you like mom and pop bookshops too, don't you? Try bookshop.org. Not even a dot com. We're a dot org because we believe in books. And meanwhile, Ingram is the force behind it. That's sorry. That's that's press release 101 behind, was what's going on there. Keep going. Yeah. Well, I, I having said that, I will say this because, again, a lot of the stuff that you, that you said, we don't really know how all that stuff shakes out. But. But I did found this on the bookshop.org about page. Okay? okay. So this is this is directly from their about page. As more and more people buy their books online. Oh, wait a minute. That that reminds me of number three. <laughs> Here's before I even go into that, and I we do, we do, I do I do want to tell you about bookshop.org. Uh, but the the third reason that I that this uh, isn't gonna change how I do my books at all is that for 20 years. Sales have been moving online and particularly Mm -hmm. last year was a big year for that during the pandemic. A lot of people got used to buying stuff online, Uh, but people have stopped going to uh, 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 the the percentage of people going to bookstores in person for their books as, as opposed to just going and buying them online. That has been steadily marching towards online for 20 years, two zero years. This is nothing that we get to be surprised about anymore. Uh, I, 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 I like, th- listen, there's an independent used bookstore in my neighborhood. I love, I, I w- got my big book of John Buscema art from them. I love them. They're great. Uh, they don't fit into my business plan <laughs> because where 99% of the people are shopping for my books are online, either right. my site, Amazon, right. Powell's, et cetera, et cetera. And that's been the case for 20 years. It's been getting steadily more and more so. So uh, putting any amount of effort behind getting an evil ink book into an independent bookstore is uh, a, an activity that has a very low priority for me. Why low? Because I've been paying attention for 20 years and seeing this thing go in a very definite direction and it isn't towards brick and mortar stores. So having said that, here's what I know, what I can share with you, Dave, about bookshop.org. As more and more people, this is from their site, buy their books online. We wanted to create an easy, convenient way for you to get your books and support bookstores at the same time. Uh If you want to find a specific local bookstore to support, find them on their map and they'll receive the full profit from your order. Otherwise, your order will contribute to an earnings pool that will be evenly distributed among independent bookstores, even those that don't use Bookshop. Stores that are affiliates who sell books online using bookshop.org by sharing their links uh, on social media, email newsletters on their websites, earn 30% of the cover price on any sales they generate without having to do the work of inventory, picking, packing, et cetera. 30% of the cover price is the entire profit margin. Bookshop doesn't earn any money off of bookstore sales. All profits go to the sale, uh, go to the store. And all the orders are fulfilled through Ingram. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This there's a big hole in this story. Thirty percent. All mm-hmm. the profits go to. So that's the key word right there because Ingram isn't doing that picking and packing for free, right? No, they're not. So 
they're they might not be calling it profits, but their expenses, wink, wink, are 20 percent of that cover price or 30 percent of that cover price. So they might not be calling it profits, but their expenses, wink, wink, are going to be some chunk like that. Perhaps allegedly, in, in Brad, other words, you so, know that so Ingram that... is not picking and packing for free. <laughs> they're not a charity no. organization. They're not doing it for free. No. We well, listen. The other thing is we don't know. But listen, what you're saying is what my guess would be as well. Yeah. Well, so okay. Another thing to consider here is that, uh, I, in general, I see I can see broad strokes that this might benefit small bookstores if a small bookstore yeah. can actually get their consumers to click the little map that has their icon in Fort mm -hmm. Collins, Colorado with Mrs. Pilkington's mm -hmm. Blue Sky Books. Uh, by the way, good on my memory for remembering that whole shtick that I'd come up with 10 minutes yeah, ago. Yeah, Pilkington uh, is a good comedy name anyway. Yeah, that it, it sticks with you. Um, but like, I, I feel like Ingram is kind of uh, already uh, aware that the average consumer could give two shits about their local bookstore and is, or even if they do, is not going to go through the extra three steps to find the map, click the map, search the map, all that kind of stuff, right? And mm -hmm. so it's going to go into this pool. I guarantee mm -hmm. you Ingram is going to have an administrative fee for, for managing that pool. It's not going to be I would imagine the that that would be the case, yes. Right. I would, so for I, the, I, in other words, I don't know how somebody could do it without taking on something to right. make that as a business worth their time. Exactly. They're either going to charge it as a banking fee or an electronic administration fee or something, right? Yeah. And then they're going to have a separate fee for the picking and packing of the books. They're going to have a separate fee for the warehousing. You know that's Ingram's business model to charge for the warehousing, so they're going to charge for that. So none of those line items are going to show up as taking a chunk of the profits, quote-unquote, but it's going to yeah. come out of your sales as a, as a, as a uh, independent bookseller. Which is why, let's jump into the next question because it's absolutely going to springboard off of this, which is to own and control your own business. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. So, Brad, this question comes in from Nathan over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Nathan writes, I was hoping you guys could expound a little bit on the mechanics of how you sell books, if not at cons. I'd love to hear about the things you do to move books, grow your audience and connect with that audience without going to cons. Thanks a lot, Nathan. That's a great question to follow up with because... This is in opposition to what uh, bookshop.org is offering from Ingram and Kickstarter. Um, and by the way, just one little caveat on that last thing with bookshop.org. If we're being charitable about it, if yes, we're being charitable, yes. you, Brad, have a skew count now of, uh, I don't know, probably 15 to 18 books. Uh, Easily. I have, the, I have a similar skew count of 15 to 18 books. I don't know. Um, and so we have a whole collection. There may be the type of person who I am only going to produce one book. That's all I'm ever yeah. going to do. I did my Kickstarter. I made a profit. I now have 500 to 1,000 extra. Bookshop.org is for me. I can see that being the, yeah. uh, there is an audience of that kind of person on Kickstarter. So just uh, being a little more charitable than my initial grumpy self, that person probably exists. Well, and, and, and like we said, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. The best we can do is kind of guess. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't take any of this as, well, this is what Ingram's doing, clearly. Uh, we're, we're giving you our best guess on a, on a lot of the, the yeah, dealings. Absolutely. But uh, it doesn't change the outcome. Uh, it, 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 the answer to the question is this is going to change nothing in how I do my books and how I do my books uh, and how you do your books uh, is the topic of this next question. Right. And basically you're seeing us in that question and in this question asking 
the why behind the what, which is why yeah. do we do, why is bookshop.org being set up? Why do Brad and Dave set up their book sales the way they do? And the, mm -hmm. the reason we do it the way we do it is because when you own and control as much as you can about your own book distribution, you're removing a lot of those middlemen. And it may yeah. not seem that a 20% slice here, a 30% slice here, in some cases with distributors, a 55% slice here uh, is going to be ruinous to your business. But I'll tell you what, not having that slice taken out I can sell markedly less books and still make markedly higher profits than someone who is using a distributor or who mm -hmm. is selling mainly through whatever, you know, uh, um, uh, in terms of distribution. So, um, Brad, I'll go first. Here's how I do it now. And the caveat here is that this could all change in five years as it was different five years ago. So now the bulk of my sales to my pre-existence, pre-existence, pre oh my God, pre-existing audience. There's a word that apparently my tug did not want to form. Uh, pre-existing audience that I have built and cultivated by giving away my comics for free for years uh, is to sell mainly via Kickstarter to that mm -hmm. audience, right? That's the main... Yes. Uh, uh, initial point of distribution. And, and it gets both the book made, it underwrites the book being made, but it also sells the bulk of the books, I would think, for most of my titles. Some not so much, but for others, definitely. Uh, I would say somewhere in the range of 60 to maybe as high as 80% of the books are sold through that initial Kickstarter run. Mm -hmm. and then... If I'm not selling it at conventions, which in this past year I did not, uh, I'm selling mainly through my own online Shopify site. Uh, I like Shopify. Uh, because of my SKU count, I think I have to pay for the second or third tier, which is a little more expensive of Shopify. Uh, Shopify is great both for tracking inventory. It's great for sales. It's great for pricing, shipping, all that sort of stuff. I really like Shopify. But there's also three or four other market-leading software platforms that you could use uh, in terms of e-commerce or uh, what's the other ones, Brad? I always forget the other ones. Um, well, I haven't looked into it in so long. I don't remember the names, but there's there's plenty of e-store e e options yeah. for you out there. But for me, Shopify is akin to MailChimp. They're sort of the market leader at what they do, and I, I like yeah. the way they do it, and I don't mind paying the price for what, what they charge every month. Um, so that's that's the main one. And then I have some smaller ones. Like, obviously, uh, um, I do some distribution in the in the north uh, Northwest, sorry, through Seattle, Portland, and uh, the Washington, Oregon area, roughly through Emerald uh, Comics Distribution. They do, um, uh, and does a really nice job of, of driving around physically to stores and distributing independent and upcoming comics. And I just like that model. I think that's neat. Um, yeah. And so um, it's, a, it's a more throwback to the kind of 70s way of doing comics, kind of like Jeff, Jeff Smith uh, in the 80s driving around the Midwest to sell bone, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like that model. And then I'm trying to think of anything else, Brad. I'll, I'll, we'll jump it over to you because maybe you'll trigger uh, some of the smaller ways that I might get books out. But you go first. What is your way of getting Evil Ink books out to the world? Well, it's, it's basically the same, everything that you just mentioned, uh, plus a one that you didn't mention, and that is putting your stuff out on Amazon through Advantage. Oh, that's Amazon the one I Advantage. forgot. Yep, yep, that's yeah. the one that I, yeah. So uh, that's, uh, and that's that's uh, become more and more significant as well, uh, is it, just put it in a, it's very easy, uh, theoretically, to put your stuff on Amazon Advantage. There, there is no good user interface uh, on any Amazon product other than the Amazon store. So uh, it, it, take that with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, respectively or respect, uh, uh, you know, in, in comparison to other things, it's not impossible <laughs> to get your stuff on the Amazon store. And that's, uh, and that's significant. And then it's, it, it, so what basically what Dave and I have outlined for you is selling on Kickstarter, selling on your site, and then selling through distribution methods like Amazon or some small distributors. I haven't put anything out on, on Diamond in the last uh, few years. And to be honest with you, with the writing on the wall in terms of what's going on in comics distribution right now, I'm not exactly breaking my back to uh, put any new titles out through Diamond. I'm I'm happy to replace that with mm -hmm. Amazon Advantage mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of shrug as far as that, especially when it comes to actually you know, the trying to read Diamond uh, Comics's invoices and and oh, when, <laughs> when they send you that email about what you supposedly sold and woof. So. Uh, so then that is the main way that uh, the way the main uh, process 
type stuff that Dave and I both have for selling. Kickstarter, online sales on our own site, and then through distributors like Amazon. Now, how do you sell books? Well, it all comes back to that stuff that we talk about on the show week after week after week. Social media and your website. If you, uh, uh, social media, a lot of my social media is involved in trying uh, every once in a while, giving you a good reason to go back to my site. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not going to send you back there to read the comic. That's a no, no, but I will give you a reason to head over to the site every now and again. I'll give you a reason to go over there. And, and I, I find out through polling year after year, uh, uh, the vast majority of my readers are visiting the website a significant amount of time when they do they get book pitches <laughs> they get a whole column of here's some books that you can buy they get it up in the slider at the top uh there's all kinds of outreach on my site and on social media that says hey i do books they're great you should buy one right uh that and then there's all kinds of ways for them to do it right? Whether they prefer buying things on Amazon or they prefer buying it through the online store, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, get out there and get it one. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, that's how you do it. It, it, it It's through uh, mainly through talking on social media and, and remembering uh, that you, it's going to feel to you like you're mentioning it all the time. But remember when you're trying to get something good out or you're trying to get something non-commercial out to your people on social media. You know that they're not getting every message you send. Right. Uh, and and so you already know that, but then when it comes to a commercial message, somehow that turns off in your brain and you're, you, you feel like you're repeating yourself. Well, yeah. no, you're not just like those other messages. Only one or two people heard those too. Right. <laughs> so you've got to repeat the commercial messages too. Hey, by the way, I've got a book. Here's how you can buy it. That's how you sell your books. If you're not going to conventions, you do everything that we talk about on Comic Lab week in and week out. You put the structures in place and then you prom- that you talk about it on social media and your website. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, Amazon A because I had forgotten it. But it's also worth mentioning that uh, I sell the bulk of my non Kickstarter sales through my Shopify site. Right. But yeah, uh, since Brexit, Britain's VAT has become increasingly impossible to try to navigate. And yeah. the European Union has also updated their VAT rules for imported, quote unquote, uh, sales of of American books and tchotchkes and stuff. So uh, the VAT rules and the shipping cost is like a one two punch of complication for American cartoonists, probably Canadian too, selling to Britain and to to the EU. And so even though I in general jumped into the Amazon Advantage bandwagon because I saw where the future was headed and I wanted to have a toe in those waters. Now, yeah. thankfully, it's also a great place to point my readership to say, hey, this is a better place to to deal with the VAT and the shipping cost because Amazon will cover that 747 flying from the U.S. daily to uh, Europe, and my book will get added onto that plane. You won't have to pay more than local shipping to get it in Australia or to get it in Brussels or to get it in London, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Mm-hmm. Um, for better shipping and for, frankly, better handling of a, of a labyrinthine uh, VAT rule system, order my books through Amazon. Don't go through my Shopify site. And more and more, that's going to have to happen because that's getting that VAT filing is getting ridiculous in terms of Britain, especially. And um, oh, yeah, Brad, jump in. Go ahead. I don't know whether you saw it on the Discord, but one of our uh, Comic Lab Discord members, Glenn, just pointed out, I think yesterday, that the VAT uh, changed again. <laughs> and for a while, they had like a threshold that you didn't have to pay VAT taxes if you didn't meet the threshold. And according to Glenn, and and Glenn's a pretty solid guy, so I don't I don't doubt it. But I haven't checked it and verified it myself. Uh, but according to him, it's they they've removed that threshold again, and now everybody owes VAT for everything. According to what he's saying, I again I haven't checked it out, but I do know this. It isn't going to get simpler anytime soon. And no. I think it, it just uh, upset the apple cart yet again. 
Yeah. So uh, anyway, to put a big summary on on this question for you, Nathan, uh, for Brad and I, and again, this is our current situation. It might change again within three to five years. We've got to keep our head on a swivel and we've got to be ready to pivot. But right now, the bulk of the sales are Kickstarter. Um, and then I tend to overprint by somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent range of what I ordered on Kickstarter. And I sell those for the next uh, three to five years on my website and at conventions. I personally love selling at conventions. Conventions. The the three or four that I do are a nice little uh, income, so I do still do conventions. But uh, so Kickstarter, uh, Shopify would be second on my list. The conventions would be third, and then way down from there would be the independent dis- distributor I use in the Northwest, uh, Amazon Advantage, which frankly only brings in like a thousand dollars of profit a year. It's not Amazon Advantage is not a money maker yet. It's basically uh, like I said, it's a it's a toe dipped in the water. Uh, and Brad, any other uh, summarizing thoughts for you on how you sell your books there? Nope, nope. I think that wraps it up uh, very nicely. And as a matter of fact, we've got another question from a Comic Lab backer that I'd like to uh, pitch to you right now. This comes in from Alexander, who says, Dear Brad and Dave, love your podcast, a constant source of joy and inspiration. Through my cartooning career, I've made both comic strips and single panel gags. And he just notes in there what he's talking about with the single panel gag is like the far side. Which, uh, by the way, it, that's an excellent way to do it. But it, it always tickles me that uh, everybody's go-to for describing a single panel gag is The Far Side, which was published 40 years ago. <laughs> There's been so oh many God. great single panel comics out there, but it's always everybody's go-to. It just points to the amazing uh, popularity it, well, frankly, of, of Gary because it Larson. Was the, it was the apex of the game was The Far Side. It it's really like pointing was. to Calvin and Hobbes, which was also 35 years ago or 40 years ago. Yeah. It's just, it just amazes game. me that, yeah. that, that, and, and that's a, re- if you said, oh yeah, I do a comic strip like Bloom County, that was great too. But uh, uh, somebody 20 years old wouldn't know what you're talking about. Right. But if you say the far side to a 20 year old, you're still going to get a good hit ratio. It's well, amazing. To, to be fair, Andrews McNeil has done a really good job of continuing to milk that cow for 40 years. Yeah. Just yeah. like they've done with Calvin and Hobbes. They really have the calendars, the books on far side are still big annual sellers for far side at Christmas and stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, anyway, I've made both strips and single panel gags. As a writer, Alexander says, I prefer strips being able to tell a story and to have a cast of characters. But as an artist, I enjoy single panel comics, especially the format itself. So my question is, is it possible to tell real stories with a cast of characters in the form of a single panel comic? Has it even been done before? I'd love to hear your opinions on the subject. Thank you and greetings from your number one Norwegian fan, Alex. Ah, I'm never going to I'm never going to get past the fact that uh, we have a Norwegian fan. How exciting. I know. So, uh, Alex, that's a great question. And it's actually a fun one to talk about in terms of let's jump right back into where we were at the beginning of this week's show, where we said a story at its at its most uh, bare bones is a hero facing a problem who has a goal to get past uh, that problem for, right? Those are the three elements of stories. It was a little chewy the way I described that, yeah, but you get a, what I'm going with there. with a goal and there's an obstacle to that yeah, goal. Uh, yes, there we go. That's, Brad, oh, mwah, chef, this is why I keep Brad around. It's not just for the, it's not just for his twitching goatee. All right, so, <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, if we take that as a story, here's the problem, is that that's a lot of ground to cover in a single panel comic. And so what ends up happening with a single panel is you kind of get two of those elements. You don't get all three, right? So you get the hero every week. Oh, hey, it's Marmaduke. He's a big dog. Or, oh, hey, it's the Dennis the Menace. He's a little shit that no one likes. All right. Like, so you get uh, you get the character, the hero. They're established. They're repeated. They're there every week. You, you know what they are. They're almost trope-like. They're so established, right? In fact, they mm-hmm. are a trope. They're just, I am the thing. I'm a big dog. Hey, I am a little shit. I'm a six-year-old kid. I'm Dennis the Menace. Or right, <laughs> what, whatever it is. Uh, uh, so you get where I'm going with it. Um, but they, you don't get the obstacle, or if you do, you don't tend to get the 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 goal, right? Or if you get the goal, you don't tend to get the obstacle because really the yeah. whole thing is constructed for the punchline. That is the entire purpose of a single panel strip. Yeah, yeah. I and and so I, I'm even going to take it further than that, and, and that is this: uh, 
We already know from years and years of newspaper comics that it's hard enough to tell a story in four panels a day. Mm -hmm. And, And in a newspaper landscape where your audience always picked up that same newspaper every week and whether they liked it or not, they were exposed to your comic. And eventually if they started reading it, they were going to be exposed to it day after day. And that's how a storyline driven newspaper comic worked is that they, they just had it every day in front of them. Even with all of that in place, it was hard enough to tell a story uh, because what you had to do is recap yesterday's comic in the first panel, do story progression in the next one or two panels. And then in the last panel, I uh, give a little uh, uh, a teaser for tomorrow's comic. So it'd be recap story, story cliffhanger or teaser right? Uh, for tomorrow's comic. Now that was an incredibly difficult way to tell a story. Mm-hmm. And, and one that I will argue to my dying day is completely off the table. Given today's publishing landscape of online comics dominated by social media uh, it, 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 if you're doing a comic strip to do a storyline, I think you're making a huge mistake. I think you got an uphill battle at that point. But all of which to say, if you're going to try and do that in one panel, somehow you're going to recap, do story progression and a teaser in one panel. Uh, I think that's impossible. I think it's completely impossible. I don't even know if anybody's done it before, but think about how your potential readers are going to be exposed to this comic. They're going to be, let's say that your storyline, and I'm just saying this so there's a number, this storyline takes 100 individual panels to to tell. Mm Mm-hmm. On social media, the first time I see your comic is panel 13. And I have no idea what happened in the first 12, and I'm never going to know what happens in the next however many uh, there are after 13 because I can't do math on the fly because I don't care because that 13 completely mystified me and didn't make any sense. And that's how everybody's good. The whole way that this works is that when you put this on social media, you give them enough of a chunk that they're at least interested in finding out what's going on. That's that's every time you put something on the web, your whole idea is to at least get somebody interested enough that they follow your account so they can see more stuff. One panel of story progression. I think it's impossible. Let me make a counter argument because I'm just sort of curious to hear your response. First of all, I think you're right. Uh, Second of all, if there was ever a single panel comic that had a cast of characters that told a story or real stories, uh, the the one I think that got closest to the mark, even though it never had storylines, the overall comic told you a story, I think would be Family Circus. What do you think about that? A hundred percent disagree. Whatever happened in the, in that story? Tell me, tell me what the goal and the obstacle was to that story and how that was ever resolved. The goal of that story was abstinence. Um, the, uh, well, it worked for me. (laughs) No, the goal, the goal of that story was here is a family and they're on a journey, right? The problem of course, is that they were frozen in time. PJ was always, uh, in his diapers. Uh, Billy was always whacking somebody with a stick, right? They never, they never advanced, right? They never went anywhere. And that's another problem with single panel is that you're frozen in time. Um, so it's kind of like a sitcom in the sense that you're back to where you started every 30 week, every 30 minutes in a sitcom, because you're not really advancing a story. You're just revisiting friends. Um, the same was true for family circus. What I was trying to get at, I was trying to search my history of comics of any comic in single panel that might have told a story, but it took 10 to 20 to 30 years to tell it. I would say, and this is, if my best example is Family Circus, there's really no good examples because even that didn't tell a story. It gave you a slice of life. It gave you a peek in through the window. It didn't give you a story per se. It just said, oh, look, here's this family and they have a lot of kids. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I, I just don't, I don't see how you could do it. Now let's drill down a little bit deeper, Dave, because I, I, reading that story out loud, I caught something. As a writer, I prefer strips, being able to tell a story. 
But as an artist, I enjoy single panel comics. Oh, what good does that catch. tell you, Dave? Good catch. What does that tell you? Huh. Is that as the writer, it obviously is more satisfying and and frankly, uh, la- the, the return on investment for the labor involved for that writing is I can get out exactly what I want to say if I do a strip. By being an artist that's enjoying single panel, my spidey sense is the return on investment is, oh, it's tiring to draw all these panels. What if I could draw yeah. it in one panel? That's what I feel like. Yes. What are you hearing, Brad? I'm hearing exactly the same thing. It tell, it, it, it's saying you don't want to draw all that much or you don't want to draw that volume of work, which, mm-hmm. by the way, is okay. It is okay. It, yeah. it, when you catch cartoonists in their bare moments and they say, oh, my God, I, I don't want to draw this scene again or I don't want to draw this background again. Right. Or right. I, it, that's a, I, I felt that way. Dave has felt that way and where we, we set up a scene and it's like, oh, why did I do this to myself? Why can't I just have a puppet show comic? Where yeah, I hate writer talking? Dave right now. Artist Dave hates yes, writer Dave. Yes. Yeah, it's a normal feeling. It's yes. normal and natural to resist because the art part is very labor intensive and it's very difficult. Uh, I think it's a normal feeling. I, 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 I'm going to tell you, don't let yourself off the hook. Either just buckle down and do that art <laughs> for your story or find a collaborator that'll do the art. If, if you're that resistant to doing the art that you're like, I, w- I would throw this whole thing away if it just meant doing one panel, right? right. If you're that resistant to it, find a collaborator who, who, is, who would love to take something well-written and, and not have to worry about the writing part and just draw to their heart's content. Uh, it, it, that might be, and, and by the way, uh, there's no dishonor in that. <laughs> there, there's a lot of very good collaborations that are based on that. If that's actually you own it and start looking for a writer. Yeah. And if you're starting and Brad, feel free to course, correct me on this. I think, remember that the, the, it's, it's worthwhile to just be super reductive at what formats do best. Yeah. Uh, a single panel does distilled writing, comic strip focused writing perfect. That's what that's meant yes. for. A yes. comic strip does character focused, situational focused comic strip writing, a punchline uh, a writing perfect. Pages yeah. do stories perfect. Uh, whether it's a full page, half page, graphic novel, whatever you want to do. The page structure works perfect for stories, long form stories. Uh, and Brad, again, feel free to course correct me if you, if you can say that better. But so wh- whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're trying to decide what you want to be writing, just keep that in mind that a single panel is best for distilled, bam, you're in, you're out, punchline only writing. Uh, a, a comic strip is better for situational or character based punchline writing and pages are better for long story. Um, yeah. And I think uh, I it's, an, it's an interesting, though, though, that all of us, like you said, Brad, all the artists, no matter who you are, there's a percentage of, or there's a part of the process where you hate the writer version of you and you wish they would go <laughs> run off a yes. cliff. And that's something that we you don't hear people talk about that one at all because they're they're a little bit scared to admit it because we all it's, it's kind of like imposter syndrome. I thought that I was the only person that ever felt that way until I heard somebody else saying, oh, my God. I can't stand drawing this page. <laughs> I want to be done with it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it. It's 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 a little bit more universal than you think. Well, one final question, Brad, because I, I I want to just go out on this, is that I think we both, are, of all of our favorite single panel comics, I think everyone knows that Brad and I are huge fans of Ziggy. And Brad, what was your favorite <laughs> Ziggy of all time? What was that punchline that you had that you loved oh my for gosh. Ziggy? I, it, I know you remember this one. Yes, uh, it was Ziggy walking his dog. And he said... They say dogs are man's best friend, but I think my best friend is cheating on me. <laughs> Was that off the cuff? Oh, right damn, off the that, cuff. <laughs> ah, oh, that's my favorite bit is when we pitch Ziggy punchlines. All right. <laughs> I'm Ziggy. <laughs> yeah, I'm Ziggy. Uh, but they, listen, as we're coming down to the end of the show, I've got a treat for you, Dave. Oh, okay. uh, we haven't really discussed this too much. Remember when we talked about people who are not comic strip or comics people that are listening to our show? Yes. Well, we got an email from one of them. This one came in through the contact form on uh, webcomics.com, as a matter of fact. But uh, this uh, this comes in from somebody, and I'm looking for their name, and I don't see. Oh, 
uh, Taju. Taju. Remember, uh, which is like, uh, must. I'm going to guess that's a Polish derivation of Todd or Tad, because okay. I had an uncle, Edju, who actually introduced me to comics. If you remember my story about Uncle Edju, the trucker. <laughs> who uh, was my introduction to comics. So this comes in from Tadju, who says, I am a hospice nurse, meaning I care for people and their families through the end of their life. Oh. After nursing school and before children, I ran into a bit of free time. I always enjoyed making comics since the day I was born. So I went back to the literal drawing board, had an idea, completed the thumbnails for a graphic novel. As I was working on finishing the project, I started caring for a person who had severe pain. The medical director for our company is in his 80s. And that amuses me to say because of this fact, not only is the hospital, uh, not as, not only is he the hospice medical director, he's also a client, unquote. <laughs> little, little, I like the company so humor. much, I bought the company. All right, keep going. Yes. When I told him how much pain meds the patient was on, he said to me, I've been doing this job for a little while now, and he is taking the most opioids I have ever seen in all of my years so far. This patient was on all of these pain meds, and I still struggled constantly with his comfort. Anyway, one day we were talking and I told him uh, I was working on a graphic novel and he asked to read it. The comic is not suitable for work, but I figured if I could help him enjoy life a little, I will have done my job. I took him, it, it took him a long time to read it, but when he did, I asked him about it and he said, it was brilliant. I cared about all the characters and I want to see them again. And the story is excellent. And I was absorbed and I was so into it that I would forget to take my pain meds. And then I'd start thinking, why am I, why am I in so much pain? Oh, I forgot to take my pain meds. My comic was therapeutic for his comfort in death and dying, which is obviously another passion of mine. I was determined to complete it before he passed. And I did. Oh, that's great. Keep going. So there's somebody uh, that that basically uh, had this thing, a passion project, shared yeah. it with a dying patient that was maxing out on opioids. And the feedback was, I like this so much, I forgot to take my pain meds. Oh, that is genuinely heartwarming because yeah. that gets to the crux of... <sighs> kind of why we do what we do, which is, hey, we love the process. We love being artists. Uh, but, you know, we always talk about how if we really wanted to make money, we could have gone into a very different career. You know, we all could have gone into banking if we wanted to just make money. Uh, how nice as an artist to get those kind of emails. And we've all gotten them like, hey, I lost my mom this year and your comic really carried me through a dark moment. Or, yeah. hey, I just went through a divorce and your comic really carried me through a, a tough six months. Or those emails I hold on to in my heart for a very long time because yeah. I have been in those places myself where a real tragedy hits my life for a year or six months or something. And it's art that is carrying me through, you know? And so yeah. when my stuff does that for someone else and when your stuff does that for someone else, that's, that is no joke. That is the the reason behind what we do, what we do. That is, that is a great, great feeling. Thank you for sharing that yeah. with me. Gosh, that's nice. Yeah, I, I thought you'd like that, especially knowing that you could help somebody in, you know, <laughs> the big moment of their life yeah. uh, is, is kind of nice. And, and, and it shows Tad, you want how anything powerful. Else? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. really, yeah. that means a lot to Brad and I. Thank you for that. Gosh, that's absolutely. And with that, we're going to talk about ushering this show out of its. <laughs> out oh, of its Brad, uh... <laughs> don't do that as a comparison, Brad. No, no. It's the only, it's the only transition I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> and as well. we shuttle this episode off to the grave, we also say, oh God, don't. I guess we're kind of whistling past the graveyard by that, by doing yeah, it that way. But I guess yes, we are. <laughs> well, then I'll just say this. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been making a living, and we're going to emphasize living on. <laughs> Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil comic.com. The good thing we didn't press release it up and say that you were going to make a killing from comics. 
<laughs> and my friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And we forgot to mention it at the top of the show, so I'll say it now. If you want to watch the show live every week, we call it Comic Lab Live Gab. Uh, it records live. You can jump in uh, and watch us, and you can see the uh, archive show as well. If you join us over at patreon.com slash comic lab at the $10 level, and we will see you next week for Live Gab. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode and all episodes was edited by Matt Woodard of One Song Productions over at www.woodsong.net. Song.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like Ziggy. Patreon.com slash comic lab. I'm Ziggy. I'm... So, Brad, given your yeah. comics tells, the fact that your eyebrows are doing a whole dance, your ears, your goatee, your, your nostrils are flaring like uh, like intake valves for a jet. Um, you could have a whole second career, my friend. If comics don't work out, you could have a whole second career as a cooler at a poker table for a casino. Oh, yeah. Couldn't you see me when somebody's really got a hot streak and... <laughs> I sit down next to him and start quivering my goatee and waggling my eyebrows at him. <laughs> Most people would just get up and leave. <laughs> Who is this guy? Unfortunately, that same skill set that makes you the perfect cooler uh, for a poker game makes you terrible in the bedroom. Like, things are going along, then the goatee starts quivering, oh, the nostrils are flaring, and the mood has receded. Yeah. <laughs> Midway through go goatee quiver is usually when she says, ah, oh, geez, not tonight, I've got a headache. <laughs>